Okay, praise the Lord. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for Thy faithfulness for this day which Thou hast made, that we rejoice and be glad in it. We thank Thee for forgiveness this day, our daily bread, as Thou knowest our needs before we even ask. And as man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceedeth out of Thy mouth, as newborn babes, we desire the sincere milk of Thy word, whereby may grow thereby as thou hast magnified the word above all of thy name, thy pure words are those preserved for us. We pray those even sanctify us for thy truth, for thy word is truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Before I begin preaching from God's word once again, I'd like to give another testimony. Let us turn to the Bible's book of Psalm 37, verse 23. The 37th Psalm, Psalm 37, verse 23. Once again, we serve a living God. And as we labor together with the Lord, as we serve the Lord, we have testimonies to give every day. Once again, back when the Lord ordered our steps to Hawaii, to the Door of Faith Church, at that time they had services on Sunday evening, and a Sunday morning and Sunday evening, Monday evenings, Tuesday evening, Wednesday evening, Thursday you wash your clothes, Friday evening, and then no service on Saturday as they're not Seventh-day Adventists. And every service he had to give a testimony. They had testimony time for every service. And the pastor of the church says, if you did not have a testimony to give, you must not even be saved. Because if you're saved and you're walking with the Lord, you'll always have a testimony to tell and a new testimony, a fresh testimony as we serve a living God. In Psalm 37, verse 23, it is written, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Praise the Lord. I'd like to testify how the Lord ordered my steps this past week to Chantanabri, Thailand, on the eastern seaboard, next on the Thai Cambodian border. Praise God. And the Lord ordered my steps, sent me forth, as I testified about last week. God supplied the need the day before I traveled, and then the day that I traveled, praise God, I had enough to get there and get back with a little bit left over, praise the Lord, and there on the Thai-Cambodian border in Chantabri, Thailand, I met a sister in Christ I had not seen for close to a decade. This is a Filipina sister in Christ. She runs an orphanage on the Thai-Burmese border, completely on the west side of Thailand, but there on the east border between Thailand and Cambodia and Chantanaburi, not by chance, not by coincidence, we ran into each other, praise God. And she was very happy to see me, and when she saw me, she invited me to come back to that orphanage. She's still running on the Thai-Burmese border to come anytime soon. Now we're in contact together to get those dates down of when the Lord has sent me there. But I want to praise God. The Lord ordered my steps at Chantanaburi to open a door for me once again on the Thai Burmese border and San Clavery amongst this orphanage there on the Thai Burmese border. Praise God, God opens one door to open others' doors, and this is how it is when you're doing the work of an evangelist. As is written, Psalm 37, verse 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. How is it that I've been able to preach all over this country of Thailand? Because the Lord orders my steps. And God opens one door to open others' doors. Because one door opens another door, which will open other doors. This is how it was back in 2003. In 2003, a friend of mine was born again and invited me to come to church with him. He was a very wealthy man at that time. And as he went to this very large church that was pastored by a very well-known Thai pastor amongst the Thai Christians. Because I went to that church with that wealthy man who was a former senator, 
the Thai pastor of the church allowed me to give a testimony from the pulpit of his church to his church on the Lord's Day. Now, going by the flesh, this was a great opportunity because this pastor was very well known. And if he gave you a good recommendation, many churches would then open their doors for me. So as I went up there, I gave a testimony. I gave, of course, a recent testimony of how I went to preach the gospel in the IDC, Immigration Detention Center. And as I was waiting in the line to get into that prison to preach the gospel, there were some Mohammedans in front of me. So, of course, as we're waiting to be checked, as you had to go to prison, they check you down, pat you down, check your shoes, check in your pockets, check everything in your hands to make sure you're not bringing any illegal contraband into that prison of IDC. As you're waiting in the line, these two Thai Mohammedans, as I was preaching the gospel to them, they asked me, how come you're not a Muslim, what they call a Muslim, which we call Mohammedans. They asked me, why aren't you a Muslim? And I said to them, well, that's easy. I said in the Thai tongue, because Allah, the God of the Mohammedans, is not God. One of them heard that, put his hand back as if he was going to backslap me for saying that, and I started laughing. Why was I laughing for? Because if Allah is God, why must he backhand me for? You can speak bad about my God all you want. I don't have to fight for my God. You can blaspheme his name. You can say bad things toward my Lord. I'm not going to fight for my God because he is God. He takes care of himself. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Therefore, when this Mohammedan reached his hand back to backslap me, I began laughing because that's proof that Allah is not God. As I began laughing at him about to backhand me, he began laughing as well as his Mohammedan friend. And then they said they liked me because everybody was about to back at me and I was laughing at them. We got into the IDC. I preached the gospel in a different building they were in. And when I finished, they were waiting for me at the gate. And they wanted to eat lunch with me as they wanted to know more about our faith, the Christian faith. As they said, they had never met a Christian like me before. Went out to lunch together and I preached the whole time we ate lunch. And they even paid for my lunch as well. Praise the Lord. I gave that testimony at the pulpit of this church. And that famous well-known Thai pastor, he got up and rebuked me in front of his whole church. He began giving a teaching after that that I was wrong. Because he claimed that the God of the Mohammedans, Allah, is the same God of the Bible. He claimed that we're serving the same God. And all those members of the church, they agreed with him. I stood up to withstand him and say that he was completely false and proved to him from the word of God that the God of the Mohammedans, Allah, and the God of the Bible are two completely different gods. He told me I did not know what I was talking about. He said the Quran, the book of the Mohammedans, is the same as the Old Testament of the Holy Bible. I had to withstand him again in front of his church and say, no, it is not. I have read the Quran, though it was in the English tongue. I did not read in Arabic, as I cannot read Arabic. But I've read the Quran in English. It is a complete literary mess. It's not even a chronological order. I have read the Quran in English, and I've read the Bible, of course, once a month, for the past 22 years, 12 times in a year, and I let him know they're two completely different books. He continued to rebuke me, and then he started preaching from the pulpit of his church that he has authority. He claimed that he was one of the three pillars of the Thai church in Thailand. And he named another pastor and another pastor himself and claimed they were the three pillars, and that if you withstand him what he says... They have the authority to kick you out of heaven that they will not allow you into heaven. All oh, the church got a fearful of it. Oh, they believe he had authority and I was withstanding him. After that, then he threatened me. He said, because I withstood his authority and was standing him in front of his church, that I was a rebel, that I was somebody he needs to warn all the churches about, 
and that they'll never allow me to preach in the pulpits of their churches as he boasted of the authority he had because he claimed he's one of three pillars of the Thai Christian church. This was a professing born-again Christian, a charismatic slash Pentecostal pastor saying this. And then after that, that same pastor kept his word, called all the different churches and warned them, didn't tell them about what we had a problem about. If he did that, he'd expose himself. He warned them that I was some kind of rebel and he got to keep them out of your church. So in 2003, it seemed to be an impossible case to ever preach in the pulpit of a Thai church ever again because this well-known pastor had withstood me. However, during that time, one Saturday morning, as I was praying on the rooftop of this building before they had CCTV cameras, now I've got to pray in our room so I can pray in secret, and they got cameras on the rooftop. But back then, as I was praying on the rooftop of this building on a Saturday morning, the Lord showed me, though this Thai pastor had went around and told all these different churches and never invite me to preach in their pulpits, that I was some sort of rebel, that I was a dangerous person, the Lord showed me on a Saturday morning as I was praying on the rooftop that if I would preach the gospel that evening, he would open a door for me from the pulpit of a Thai church the next day, which was the Lord's Day or Sunday. So that evening, I went to preach the gospel at Calson Road, as I was walking down Lagedan Road to Calson Road with another brother in Christ, I heard from a distance somebody call out my name in the Thai tongue. It was a Thai Christian that knew me from another church that had preached that the year before. He was a taxi driver. He was excited to see me on Lajadana Road. He knew that it was close to Kalsan Road. He had stopped this taxi knowing that I liked to preach the gospel on Kalsan Road and even confessed he was looking for me. And then when he saw me walking on the sidewalk, he was so excited, he yelled out my name. And then he told me now he's going to this other church and they all know me there. The different pastors and the people of the church, they all know me there. And gave me a track that he gives out with a church address on it and asked me if I was free the next day, which was Lord's Day, to come to that church. So I preached the gospel that night, came home, told my family that, praise God, I believe this is the door the Lord spoke about. We went to that church that next morning on a Sunday morning, the morning of the Lord's Day. As we arrived to the church, the pastor, though he had someone else who was supposed to preach, he canceled them that day and said he wanted me to preach. And as I preached in the pulpit of that church and revived that church, then that pastor began telling other churches about me, which then opened other doors for me, which those doors then opened other doors. And then for over 10 years, I was preaching at churches all over Thailand just because of that one door that opened for me that day as I was faithful to the Lord. As it's written, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. How have I been able to preach all over this country, Thailand, even with well-known pastors speaking against me, speaking false against me, as Jesus Christ says would happen in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Verse 11, the Lord Jesus Christ says, Blessed are you, and men shall revile you, and persecute you, and shall say all men of evil against you falsely for my sake. And though I had this well-known pastor who is very well-known here in Thailand, considers himself the, one of the three pillars of the Thai Christian church, speaking against me falsely, claimed that I was some sort of rebel, all because I disagree with his false teaching that the God of the Mohammedans and the God of the Christians are the same God, and he went out and told everybody I was a rebel, even though that was going on, God still opened doors for me to preach his word from the pulpit of the Thai churches, nonetheless, because the Lord orders our steps. And this is how I've been able to preach all over this country, from the pulpits of many different churches, of many denominations, throughout these years, because the Lord orders my steps. And I want to praise God once again, for the Lord order my steps to Chantemarie this past week, on the Thai-Cambodian border, 
and which I was able to meet this Filipina sister in Christ who invited me to preach at her orphanage on the Thai Burmese border coming soon. Praise God for the Lord ordered our steps and opening doors for the gospel's sake so we can preach God's word. Praise the Lord. Let us turn our Bible to the book of Acts chapter 2 once again and continue for where we've left off from the last sermon. In Acts chapter 2, once again, beginning in verse 14, it is written, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all you that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. Verse 14, the apostle Peter did not have to have anybody tell him, you need to stand up and preach a little bit, brother. In verse 14, the apostle Peter had no examples, apart from the Lord Jesus Christ and John the Baptist, but he had no examples here in the book of Acts of any of the apostles preaching the gospel. How is he, the apostle Peter in Acts chapter 2, verse 14, could stand up and lift up his voice and preach the gospel of those who were out the world of Jerusalem at that time? Because he had the Holy Ghost. When I was born again, back in 1995, nobody told me to go out in the streets and to preach the gospel. When I was born again back in 1995, I had never seen anybody preaching the gospel on the streets. I had never seen what is now known as a street preacher or an evangelist before I was born again. I had never seen such a thing. But when I was born again back in 1995, the Lord showed me He had called me to preach the gospel in public. I'll never forget back in 1995 after I was born again. My wife at the time was working. She would go to her job. At that time, I was supposed to be a prize fighter, and I just hung up my gloves as I was just born again. And then I'd wake up in the morning. His wife would go to work. Normally, I would go to the gym to work out. However, I'd hung up my gloves now, and I was going to serve the Lord, so I would pray instead and read God's Word. At that time, I was just born again. I would immerse myself in the Word of God, reading through the Bible, spending hours a day in God's Word, which I continue to do to this day. So I'd wake up in the morning. My wife would go to work. I'd begin reading the Bible to pray in, and then at 12 noon, I'd realize I haven't done anything all day. All I've been doing is just been reading the Bible. In the eyes of the world, I'd wasted that whole day. I need to do something. Of course, back then, I was a prize fighter. I'd hung up my gloves, so I did not know what to do. So I prayed to the Lord. If the Lord had told me what, whatever the Lord told me to do, I would do it. And the Lord showed me back in 1985, as I would pray to him, what do you want me to do? Where am I supposed to go? Where, what am I supposed to do with myself? As I hung up the prize fighting gloves, the Lord showed me a certain intersection here in Bangkok, Thailand, the Lachapasol intersection, where the, what they call the Erewhon Shrine is. And the Lord showed me to go there, stand in front of that shrine, and begin preaching the gospel. And back in 1995, without any man telling me to do so, without ever seeing an example of anybody doing so, as the Lord showed me that's what he wanted me to do, I began preaching the gospel on street corners here in Bangkok, Thailand, and when I began doing so, not only have anybody not encouraged me, most of the professing Christians tried to discourage me from doing so. I'll never forget, I went to a cell group meeting, as that's what Christians do, and that's what Christians did back then. Went to the cell group, me in the church, and I got rebuked for preaching the gospel. And the person leading the cell group meeting, which was a woman at that time, told me I should be a tour guide. A tour guide that is illegal for a non thai to do, but that's what this person told me that I should be doing. Could you imagine if I listened to them? If I had stopped preaching the gospel back in 1985 and became a tour guide, in 2017, you wouldn't be listening to videos of me preaching God's word with all these testimonies. You'd be joining me on some tour, looking at some temples and taking some pictures, and that's all I've done with my life. Praise God 
We obey the Lord and not man, as it is written in Acts chapter 5, verse 29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Acts chapter 2. And back in 1995, the Lord showed me when I prayed to Him, I was just born again, waking up, praying, reading the Word of God for a few hours, and then I prayed to the Lord, what would you want me to do? Whatever God told me to do, I would do it. And the Lord showed me what specific intersection He wanted me to stand and preach the Gospel, and I began doing so back in 1995, and continue to do so for the past 22 years. And just like that person at that cell group meeting, you would not believe the number of professing Christians who have tried to discourage me from preaching the gospel. Who try to tell me you should do something else with your life. You should get a job. You should serve mammon. You should do this and do that. But we obey God and not men. And the Lord had called me back in 1985 to preach the gospel. And as I came to do so, the Lord continues to supply all of our need as the Lord hath ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. In Acts chapter 2, verse 14, we have the apostle Peter standing up with the eleven, lifted his voice, and preaching the gospel to these from around the world. How can he do so? He is not only that Christ commanded to do so in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, to go into all the world and preach the gospel of a creature, he now had the Holy Ghost. John chapter 16. In the book of John chapter 16. Verse 13. The Lord Jesus Christ says of the Holy Ghost, Howbeit when he... The Spirit of truth is come. He will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself. Whatsoever he shall speak, that sh whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. In Acts chapter 2, the apostle Peter had the Holy Ghost. He had been baptized with the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. And as he had the Holy Ghost, he was now endued with power from on high. He was now in fill with God's Spirit, and the Spirit of God led him to stand up and begin preaching the gospel in this first apostolic sermon here in the book of Acts by a spiritual Christian, the Apostle Peter, preaching the gospel filled with the Holy Ghost. If a person is preaching the gospel because somebody else told him to do so, they're doing it for the wrong reason. If somebody is preaching the gospel because they want to be like somebody else, they want to be a copycat, they want to copy somebody else preaching the gospel, that's not of God. A person that preaches the gospel must do so because they're called of the Lord. Because they're filled with God's Spirit, and God's Spirit has showed them what the Lord would have them to do. For it is written once again in Romans chapter 10, Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Verse 14. How then should they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how should they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how should they hear without a preacher? Verse 15. And how shall they preach except they be sent? How shall they preach except except they be sent. You have many out there today attempting to preach the gospel, but they're not sent by the Lord. They're doing it because they're trying to copy somebody else. They're doing it because somebody else told them to do so. They're not being sent by the Lord. And the Bible says, and how shall they preach? except they be sent. If a person preaches the gospel, but is not sent by the Lord, nobody's going to call on the name of the Lord to be sent. They're not going to have any fruit. They're not going to see souls being born again. And how many do we know who are attempting to preach the gospel and they've done so for a while now? They have no testimonies 
of anybody ever getting saved. They have no testimony to anybody ever getting born again. Why is that? They were not sent by the Lord. Romans chapter 10 verse 15, And how should it reach except they be sent? Acts chapter 2 verse 14, How the apostle Peter preach? He was sent by the Lord. How is the Apostle Peter sent by the Lord? He had tarried until he was endued with power from on high. He had tarried until he was baptized with the Holy Ghost. And on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost came, filled him with the Spirit. And now the Lord has empowered him and sent him forth to preach the gospel. In Acts 2, verse 14, But Peter, standing up with the eleven lifted his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all you that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing as by the third hour of the day, but this is that which is spoken of the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. The young men shall see visions, and the old men shall dream dreams, and all my servants and my handmaidens, I'll pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. Why did God give us a spirit for? Of course, if we preached before, so he may do a power from on high to be a witness unto Jesus Christ. Why does God give us a spirit for? So the spirit of truth will guide us into all truth and show us things to come. Then we see visions and dream dreams. And what does God give us a spirit for? So that we shall prophesy. In verse 18, notice it does not say they might prophesy. Notice it doesn't say some of them could prophesy. It says in verse 18, And all my servants and my handmaidens, I'll pour out my, uh, those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Not they might. Not some of them might prophesy. Not some of them can prophesy. Not they may have a chance to prophesy, or they may prophesy every once in a while. The Bible says, and they shall prophesy. Why does the apostle Peter preach this of all things? To those who are gathered around them on the day of Pentecost, hear them preach the gospel. Why does he preach this scripture of all things? Because they were wondering what had happened to them when they are filled with the Holy Ghost. Some mocked them and said, these are men are full of new wine. They are falsely accused of being drunken on new wine. So the apostle Peter had preached to them that they had received the promise of God as was prophesied by the prophet Joel, the baptism of of the Holy Ghost. And that they were not drunk with wine, what were they doing instead? Acts chapter 2, verse 4, And they're all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Verse 5, And there dwelt in Jerusalem Jews, devout men of every nation of heaven, now when this was noise abroad, the multitude came together confounded, because that they heard every man speak in his own language, and they're all amazed and marvel, saying one to another, Behold, are not these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue where we're born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites, and the dwellers of Mesopotamia and New Judea, and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt, and in the parts of Libya and about Cyrene, and strange to Rome, Jews and Protestant, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. When the apostles were baptized with the Holy Ghost, what happened? They spake with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And as they spake with their tongues, the Spirit gave them utterance, People from around the world heard these apostles from Galilee speaking of the wonderful things of God in their very own tongue. What do we call that when somebody speaks the wonderful things of God? Prophesying. They were prophesying. 
And that's why the Apostle Peter then preaches to them from the prophet Joel, verse 18, and on my service of my handmaidens, I'll pour in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. He is led them that they were not drunk with new wine. They were filled with the Spirit of God as God had promised. And because they're filled with the Spirit of God as God promised, they were prophesying just as the Lord said would come to pass. When they're filled with the Spirit of God, they spoke with other tongues, the Spirit gave them utterance, and those tongues are not given to them to preach the gospel. No, they to preach the gospel in their own tongue. Then why do they speak with their tongues, and why do they hear them speaking in their own tongues when they spoke with their tongues? Because they were prophesying. In Acts chapter 19, we see the same thing occur. Of those from Ephesus, Beginning in verse 6, these were born-again Christians who had not yet received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The Bible says that they are believers. The Bible says that they are disciples. The Bible says that they were baptized believing disciples as well. And though they are baptized disciples of Jesus Christ, though they are believers in Jesus Christ, means they are born again, they had not yet received the baptism of the ghost, for it is written in Acts chapter 19, verse 1, And it came to pass, while Paul was at Corinth, Paul having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said to them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. These were disciples of Jesus Christ. These were believers in Jesus Christ. These were baptized believers in Jesus Christ. Thus they were born again, but they had not yet received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. How many born again Christians today we know of have not yet received the baptism of the the Holy Ghost. And the main reason why they have not received the baptism of the Ghost is the same reason these in Ephesus had not received the baptism of the Ghost. They had never heard of such a thing before. If you have not heard of it, how can you receive it from the Lord? It's a gift you must ask the Lord for. You must tarry before the Lord to be endued with power from on high. And if you've never heard of such a thing, you will not tarry nor ask the Lord for such a promise to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Though they were believers, they were born again, they were disciples of Jesus Christ, they were water baptized, they had not yet received the Holy Ghost. And then in verse 6 it is written, And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them. How do you know the Holy Ghost came on them? And they spake with tongues and prophesied. Just as the Apostle Peter preached in Acts chapter 2 from the prophet Joel, and they shall prophesy. When the Spirit of God came on the Apostles of the day of Pentecost, they spoke with the tongue of the Spirit, gave them utterance, and those from around the world heard them speak in their very own tongues the wonderful works of God. They were prophesying. As the apostle Peter preached, the prophet Joel, and they shall prophesy. And when the Spirit of God came on these here in Ephesus, they speak with tongues and prophesied. Why is it important that they must speak in tongues first before they prophesy? 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Verse 4 is the answer. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. Now before you can edify the church, what must you first do? You cannot edify the church until you first have been edified. Therefore, in order to prophesy, to edify the church, you must first edify yourself. And how can you first edify yourself? 1 Corinthians 14, verse 4. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. He that prophesieth edifieth the church. If you desire to edify the church, you must first be edified yourself. In order to edify yourself before you can edify the church, before you can prophesy to edify the church, you must first edify yourself by speaking in unknown tongues. 
And this is why in Acts chapter 19, those men from Ephesus, when they received the Holy Ghost, before they prophesied, they first spoke in unknown tongues. This is why in the day of Pentecost, when the apostles and the 120 disciples received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, they first spake in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And then as they spoke in other tongues, the Spirit gave them utterance, souls from around the world came to see what happened, and they could hear them in their own tongues, prophesying, speaking the, might, the great and mighty works of God. In order to edify others, you must first be edified yourself. And this is why in the book of Acts, when they received the Holy Ghost, they spoke in other tongues first. Acts chapter 10. In Acts chapter 10, another example. Verse 44. Well, yet Peter spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell all of them which heard the word, Cornelius and his house, and they of the circumcision which believe or astonish, as men came in Peter, because that of the Gentiles also is poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Before they magnified God, they first spoke in tongues. By magnifying God, they were prophesying, edifying the church, saying the wonderful works of God. But before they did so, they spoke in other tongues. Because in order to edify others, you must first be edified yourself. And it's God's will for all those that are Christians to prophesy. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, beginning in verse 23. If therefore the whole church be come together to one place, and all speak with tongues, and the coming those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that you're mad? Therefore we disagree with those churches in which they all speak in tongues and do not interpret. That is a false practice, and it turns people away from the Lord. And how many churches you know here in Bangkok, Thailand, do such a false practice? The church gathers together, and they all speak in tongues at one time. And when unbelievers come in, they say, they're a bunch of crazy people. They're mad. They've lost their minds. Once again, if therefore the whole church become the one place, and all speak with tongues, and they come in those that are longer unbelievers, will they not say that you're mad? Verse 4. But if all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearn, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all, and thus are the secrets of heart made manifest, and so falling down his face, he will worship God, and report that God is in you of a truth. How will this happen? If we all it is God's will for all Christians to prophesy. And if we all prophesy, an unbeliever joins us, an unbeliever comes into our assembling ourselves together and joins us as we worship the Lord and we all prophesy, they will fall down on their face before us and confess that God is in you of a truth. And this is just not just God's will to happen in an assembly ourselves together, but when we go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, and when we do so, if we all prophesy, those that are unbelievers will come to us and confess to us that God is in you of a truth. And how many times has this happened? Time and time again, when we've gathered the name of the Lord, when we've gone forth to preach the gospel, and sinners have come to us and said this of us, that God is in you of a truth. And why is that? Because of the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the ability to prophesy. I'll never forget years ago, there were so many testimonies of this, 
the one such testimony many years ago as we finished preaching the gospel in that intersection with another younger American man who was preaching the other time and we crossed the intersection and man looked back at us to mock us to say some things about us as he had seen us preaching the gospel and as we're crossing this section he turned around to say something mocking the gospel I then spoke to him and said only Jesus can get you the ditch that you've dug for yourself this deep ditch you're in his face went in a shock tears began coming out of his eyes and I told him again you have put yourself in your own ditch you have digged a deep ditch for yourself and only Jesus can get you out of this ditch and he began crying and said how did you know how do you know this because of the Spirit of God the baptism of the Holy Ghost and just like I've testified about many of times preaching in the entertainment plaza one night when nobody was listening in eyesight it could by eyesight nobody was listening to the word we're saying but I was preaching the gospel in the last because I was led by the Spirit of God and though I went with a whole group of young men I was the one that was preaching the gospel at that time because they were not walking by faith but walking by sight nobody was listening to me in eyesight but I was preaching the gospel being led by the Spirit of God come to find out Upstairs in the bathroom above me, there was a man about to commit suicide. He had put a gun to his head, was about to blow his brains out. But while I was preaching the gospel, led by the Spirit of God, what I was preaching went into the little fan, the exhaust fan that was taking the battery of the bathroom. My voice went into that fan, and the man sitting on the toilet with a gun to his head heard my voice, put his gun down, got on his knees, and began calling the Lord to save him. Because the word that I was preaching at that exact time that he heard me was what he needed to hear. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That man told me while he was sitting on the toilet and he put this Colt 45 to his head. He looked up into the ceiling and said, God, where, and he said a curse word, where the blankety blank are you? And he's about to shoot himself. He heard, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. That's where the Lord is at. He's right there. He's right there close to you. It's the Apostle Paul preached in Acts chapter 17. Verse 27. That they should seek the Lord, if happily they may fill after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Where was God when that man put that gun to his head and cried out, God, where the blankety blank are you? He's right there. He's near every one of us. And if we draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to us. And the apostle Paul preached that they should seek the Lord, they may fill after him, and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. And when that man with a gun to his head heard, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, he put that gun down, realized the Lord is right there, and called on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved, and was miraculously born again. How did that happen? Because I was preaching the gospel. But not because I was just preaching the gospel. I was being led by the Spirit of God. I was filled with the Spirit of God. And being filled with the Spirit of God, I preached the right word at the right time, which we call prophecy. And that man got down on his knees in that bathroom and called on the Lord to save him. It is God's will for each and every Christian to prophesy as is written in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 once again. Beginning verse 23. If therefore the whole church be come together to one place and all speak with tongues and there come in those who are unlearned or unbelievers, well then I say that you're mad. But if all prophesy and there come in one that believeth not or one unlearned is convinced of all, he is judge of all. And thus the secret's heart may manifest and so falling down his face he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth when what happens? When we all prophesy. And how can it be that we all shall prophesy? Acts chapter 2. Verse 17, 
the apostle be the preacher and the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I'll pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall dream, see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, and on my service on my head, minions, I'll pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. The read from the book of Acts. When anybody received the Holy Ghost, they spoke with tongues, they magnified God, they spoke the wonderful works of God, they prophesied. How is it we all shall prophesy if we're all filled with the Spirit of God? It is a promise from the Lord in these last days that we shall all prophesy. If we come together in the name of the Lord and we all prophesy, and those that are unbelievers, those that unlearned come in, the report of a truth among us that God is in us of a truth. If we go into all the world and preach the gospel of every creature and we all prophesy, then those who are drawn to the preaching of the gospel will report to us of a truth that God is in us of a truth if we're first filled with the Spirit of God. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, as thou hast magnified thy word above all of thy name. We thank thee for preserving the pure words for us. And we pray that it shall be unto us according to thy word. That we may be filled with thy spirit. That we may be baptized with thy Holy Ghost. And that we all shall prophesy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord.